Thanks for welcoming me, welcoming me here. Um, I'm part of an effective team. You can see all their names up there. And uh, we've um, devised this Mega Murray Darling Microbat project, or the Mega Microbat project for short. Um, and I put two asterisks next to two people's names, Sylvia, who you've seen around a little bit, and also Amy Linky. Um, this project actually grew out of uh, a smaller community engagement project, and we were very um, happy to hear the good news that we uh, received some funding from Inspiring Australia to actually uh, run this project and upscale it to uh, one that um, is greater in terms of geographic breadth and also its aims. So um, it's a very early days in the project, so I'm just going to outline mainly our aspirations but also uh, some of the details. <coughs> Uh, this is the project um, in pictures. Uh, basically, we're, we're looking at microbat species. So microbats are those species of bat that are insectivorous and emit echolocation to um, find their way in darkness and to capture their insect prey. So we're not looking at the fruit bats that you might have seen around in some of the cities, including Adelaide. And the way we're going to survey microbats um, in our area of interest is by recording their echolocation calls. So if you're not familiar, um, most bat species emit some kind of signature echolocation call that we can use to identify that species. It's a bit harder than that. Um, it's not as straightforward, but that's basically uh, the story. And, and you can see here, um, this is a search phase pulse of a bat, and the search phase um, pulse changes in shape as the, um, the bat flies along. Initially it's saying, where's the bug, where's the bug, where's the bug, or where's the obstacle, where's the obstacle? And then eventually, when it hears something, it'll change into, oh, I'm coming to get you. So um, that's the last bit of the pulse here. Um, so, but what, what we use is the search phase calls to identify the different species. To record the bats, um, a lot of our, uh, um, our funding is going on these uh, bat detectors or ultrasonic recorders. Um, these days, um, bat detectors have evolved over many, uh, at least two or three decades now, to these um, devices that are very, very easy to deploy. Basically, you can just load them up with memory cards and batteries, and, stick them, and anyone can stick them out and just turn them on, and you can record bats, and you can go to bed. And our area of interest is the, um, the South Australian portion of the uh, Murray-Darling Basin. So this small map here shows you the extent of the Murray-Darling Basin in Australia. And then our area of interest at the moment is the South Australian portion of it here. And then here's the Murray-Darling uh, River itself and the, the Murray Mouth down here. So that's the project outline. I said that um, we're, a, well, um, we're part of the uh, symposium or a section today on partnerships. So this is a, definitely a partnership project and we do have a great team. As I mentioned, um, <clears throat> We have uh, some great funding from Inspiring Australia, um, without which the project wouldn't be possible. Um, the South Australian Museum is, in, um, uh, I guess, uh, ultimately responsible for the success of the project. Um, but we're also uh, in charge of all the geekery, uh, and that's where I come in as the geeky scientist. Um, I'm interested in acoustic analysis and machine learning and all that stuff, and uh, all the stats analysis as well. I'll mention something in a moment more. Um, but also. Uh, we have um, a lot of management um, of many aspects of the project being, undertake, being undertaken by Department of Water, sorry, Environment, Water and Natural Resources, um, who's the government, the government land manager in South Australia, and also analysis aspects. And Mid Murray Landcare is a very important partner as well. Uh, Amy Linky is the conspicuous person in that um, uh, group. Um, she's very energetic, involved in many, many projects, and. Um, uh, she's uh, involved in the community engagement aspects, uh, the distribution logistics of all the detectors and other community programs that work interlinked with this particular uh, project. And also, um, last but not least, is the University of South Australia, Phil Roitman and Annette Scanlon, who are involved in the social engagement assessment part of uh, the project, which is very important because we want to be able to assess whether this project's been uh, successful in its many different goals. Um, and um, so they ha have out, uh, got a process um, uh, for actually measuring community participation and community attitudes. <clears throat> so um, wh why would you study a project on bats? Well, the first 10 reasons that came to mind are on the slide here. I think bats, or, or thoughts about bats, uh, tend to polarise people, in my experience, after working on them for 20 years. Um, you either really, really like them or you really, really dislike them. But 
Whether you like them or dislike them, I think everyone has a secret fascination for bats. And so um, I found that in my own experience that when I give a talk on bats, people start to um, think about questions and by the end of a, a talk, people are enthusiastic about bats, which is really good. They're not scary, they're very, very interesting, they're very cute, they're very small, and they're also precious because they're parts of our uh, natural heritage in Australia and we need to protect them. But we need to know more about them. We know that bats are interesting to people because there are these things called, things called bat nights, uh, which are very popular. People can go along and hear a talk about bats in the bush somewhere and see bats flying around with a bat detector. Um, uh, bats are also a large proportion of the mammals in any habitat in Australia or indeed the world, sometimes 25% of the mammal species, but they can reach up to 100% in very disturbed habitats. Sometimes bats are the only mammals left, particularly in urban environments. Bats are also indicators of habitat condition. Uh, different species have different sensitivities. Um, but we have very little recent information and patchy historical information about the bats uh, in South Australia and in particular the South Australian Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, there are no bat recovery plans for the Murray-Darling Basin, although there are 27 for other mammal species. Um, and three species in the uh, South Australian Murray-Darling Basin are listed on our threatened on our th on the threatened li listed as threatened under our national environmental legislation. As I said before, bats are easily surveyed by non-specialists. You put one of these things out and you basically go to bed, which is great. Um, we have the potential to expand uh, to the remaining part of the Murray-Darling Basin. You saw how big it was, and we all know how important the Murray-Darling Basin is uh, in terms of uh, water and uh, farming, etc. Um, and I'll mention um, also uh, a bit later links to other bat-related education uh, efforts. <clears throat> as I mentioned before, the project uh, has its origin in a smaller community engagement project and we're using and building on the existing networks of those, <clears throat> of that project, sorry. Um, from the many different uh, activities that the people uh, such as Sylvia and uh, Amy were involved in, there was great uh, evidence of widespread interest in bats. Uh, there was some initial survey um, undertaken using these Anabat bat detectors. Anabat is a brand of bat detector. It's actually designed and produced and manufactured and sold in Australia, so it's a great uh, success story for um, Australian business. But uh, in this smaller project, bat uh, collection was rather ad hoc and uh, it wasn't sufficient to answer the uh, questions or the aspirational questions. So we've expanded it and, and we're, we're setting it loose now. So. Uh, true to form as a taxonomist, I've grouped the very uh, many aims and aspirations of our project into four main categories. Uh, first of all, scientific. What we want to do is find out more about the distribution, the occupancy and the habitat association of bats in the South Australian uh, a part of the system. Uh, that word occupancy, there's a whole um, range of stats that sit behind that word to do with detectability and um, uh, repeated measures and all this sort of thing. It's a, a very nice, there's a very nice way of statistically um, estimating distributions that take into account not only the presence or absence of, of animals but also their detectability as well and um, other aspects such as habitat. So um, hopefully we can get all geeky with the stats as well. Uh, and <clears throat> although I've developed this um, bespoke artisanal um, or semi-automated uh, uh, bat call analysis system which I've rolled out uh, over the last decade in Papua New Guinea and just rolling out now in a national program in Cambodia. We actually want to transition it to a machine learning uh, based system as well. So that'll be exciting. Um, uh, in terms of um, our aims um, in prodding the uh, government uh, land manager, we, we really would like to um, make sure our information was inserted into park and parks and reserves management plans and a future land management policy overall. And then I put the third aim there in, in red um, because, as we all know, there's um, less and less money for conservation and citizen science seems like a very effective way to survey large areas of the country where people are already going or already living. So we don't have to pay money to uh, get government employees to go out there all the time. Um, <clears throat> it's very important uh, also to think about uh, the management that people can do on their own land. And we'd really like to encourage grassroots participation in environmental projects. Um, there's already uh, a massive amount of effort in, in this as well, and so we're hoping our project will uh, contribute to that. 
And we'd like greater efforts on private land. Um, there's, there's trees and stuff on people's private land as well. We don't want to just manage the national parks. Um, so this is a way of uh, managing all of the resources uh, in our um, precious state uh, and landscapes. And in terms of community education and awareness, um, I guess what we would really like is to have a uh, better appreciation in the public for bats. As I said before, they're part of our natural heritage. They each have an interesting little story. They each evolved from ancestors 65 million years ago, and they each do different things in the environment, and they're all special. And we really want people to understand that. And we also want people to have personal investments in conservation on private land. We want people to take ownership um, in conservation on, on their own land, on their own properties. So, <clears throat> so how does it work? Here's our modus operandi. We hand out bat detectors via our network of land care officers. So there's a structure already there in place for handing these things out. Uh, the citizen science then, scientist then moves the detector about in different places. Uh, around their property or wherever they want to go. They might choose to go into some national park that doesn't have the same coverage. Or uh, uh, um, uh, in the past of, of surveys, for example. And they also, on, an, on their uh, phone, they, um, they download this uh, app, the BioCollect app, and they're able to put in the site details that then connect straight to the Atlas of Living Australia. So there's real-time upload, well, almost real-time upload of data into the ALA. Then when they're finished, uh, all the cards are full, the batteries are depleted. They return the gear to the land care officer. Um, a trained person then processes the data, identifies the bats, adds the bat identifications to the site details on the BioCollect, and then all the information ends up on the ALA. We give feedback to the citizen science on IDs and advice. We have a, a fact sheet about how you can enhance your property for bats. Um, but also the, the results are basically available um, as soon as the analysis is done on the ALA. People can look up and you can see you know, a dot where your, where your house is. And uh, these, are the, these are the little uh, gadgets here. Um, they're very small, they're only about this big, I should have brought one in. But they take AA batteries, they take, uh, I, the ones that I send off to New Guinea are uh, loaded up with half a terabyte's worth of uh, card capacity. So they can go for like two months, no problems. People strap them to a tree and off they go. And then after the uh, citizen scientist uh, is involvement, that's when we, um, our, our team um, conducts this measurement of community participation, updates the BioCollect records, does all the uh, geeky analysis, and then um, because we have uh, stooges in the government, uh, we, um, we have the opportunity to, to inject some of this information into government policy. So um, as I mentioned, uh, Annette and uh, Phil are um, involved in the team uh, to do the social evaluations. There are before participation and after participation surveys. Basically, these surveys are to document the level of involvement and the motives for participating of people and how satisfied they were in their participation. And, uh, uh, and um, uh, we, we also want feedback as well to improve things. We, we want to know how much people know about bats as well. So there are some tricky questions about what bats eat and where they live. Um, uh, and also, um, yes, we're, we're, interest to, we're interested in evaluating people's attitudes and behaviours and how they might change through the project as well. So we have about 38 questions on a survey that people fill out. Uh, and I should say that um, our project is part of this uh, uh, um, national hub uh, on the discovery circle as well, which you'll all know about. So why would the community participate? Well, um, I just want to relate quickly uh, to end off the talk um, uh, the story of Don Lester, uh, who is our, our role model citizen scientist, a, a super citizen scientist, if you will. We asked uh, Don's um, motivations for becoming involved uh, in some of the projects um, alongside uh, the Mega Microbat project. Um, uh, Don... Um, Don is a uh, retired gentleman now, but he is a very successful businessman. He has a PhD, um, but um, he's um, uh, involved himself in many different kinds of projects, but particularly projects related to bats uh, and community education. And uh, some of his thoughts, I just want to relate here. The people I, I have met uh, that have a different focus to what I have, oh, sorry, Don's motivations are um, basically people's reactions and people's thoughts. The people I've met that have a different focus to what I've experienced so far 
and he enjoys interacting with a, ri a wide range of, of people that have a, a wide range of knowledge and experiences like the technically minded, people that are educators, scientists, environmentalists and craftsmen and he finds it very stimulating. But he's also very stimulating himself because he stimulates other people to become involved because of his gregarious personality and all the great things that he's involved in. And here he is, uh, this is Don here in the red um, jumper, and you can see some uh, participants here. They're all involved in uh, creating these uh, bat boxes where bats uh, uh, live during the day. Basically, you can enhance bushland uh, for bats by putting up uh, little roosts for them. And there's some standard designs for bats, but you actually have to make lots of these things to be effective. Um, but under Don's leadership, he's He's developed, or he's um, leading this program of um, making these flat pack IKEA style bat boxes that can then be used uh, in our school projects and, and school education. But uh, so there's the, the distribution and the um, uh, uh, learning aspect with the school, but there's also an aspect of people coming together to build these things and put them in the flat pack uh, boxes as well. Um, so. Um, by becoming part of one project, it kind of stimulates people to become uh, part of other projects as well, related projects as, as well. And um, growing out of this bat, bo bat box making uh, exercise is the Meldanda, which is a reserve uh, east of Adelaide, uh, the bat box survey. So there are, um, uh, there's a program of bat boxes that have been um, installed in this Meldanda reserve. Uh, people now, uh, like Don, will put little um, uh, cameras on sticks and look at what bats are inside the bat boxes and here you can see a Gould's wattle bat um, and so this program began um, over 10 years ago and uh, they're building on the, pro on the work by um, not only conducting uh, monthly monitoring but also improving the design of the boxes because different species have different requirements and sometimes that means a different uh, bat box design compared to say the ones in, in America. So I'll just end off the talk uh, by um, putting up some um, some of the local um, uh, bats that we that we will record, um, there's the yellow-bellied sea-tailed bat, which is a specky thing that flies over the treetops. We have the lesser long-eared bat with, with these incredibly large ears. They're also called whispering bats, so they'll be actually challenging to pick up on our bat detectors. Uh, the large-footed myotis, you can see that it has a fish in its gob. It's actually a fishing bat, and it will scoop over the water and pick up little um, fish and eat them, uh, as well as insects. And the chocolate wattle bat, or the chocky wattle bat, is, um, you can see here it has this nice brown coloured fur, is one of the more common species as well. So um, uh, I'll leave the, pro uh, the talk there, but um, hopefully uh, that gives you an overview of our project and hopefully we'll be successful. Thanks.